Tonight's lecture um, is The Scent of Literature, and our lecturer is Avery Gilbert. I think some of you might be related to him <laughs> or know him. <laughs> um, and Jean Miller, the form, a former member of the Board of Directors of the Vermont Humanities Council, will introduce Avery. In all the people I've introduced, in all aspects of my life, I've never introduced an evolutionary biopsychologist before. <laughs> and that's what Dr. Avery, Avery Gilbert is professional. He's also an entrepreneur. Um, I guess we could say he's a smell specialist. Uh, he's a graduate of Berkeley. Uh, he has master's and PhDs from the uh, University of Pennsylvania. And he has indeed run a number of businesses. Um, one of which, Syn Synesthetic Inc. So you put all these things together and you begin to get some relationships here. Uh, he has designed commercial scents for companies everywhere from perfume to kitty litter. <laughs> and I suspect some of you have seen the recent kitty litter ad with the kitten standing there. How can you find a litter box if it doesn't smell? <laughs> um, his current book, What the Nose Knows, The Science of Scent in Everyday Life, um, is up for an award um, by the LA Times Book Prize Committee for Science and Technology. See, when you put all these things together, it's quite about humanities here. Um, so I think that uh, his challenge tonight is to relate all of these experiences to literature with which most of us are familiar. And I'm sure he's up to the challenge. So let's welcome Avery Gilbert. I was the odd Gilbert that didn't go to Dartmouth College. I went to the University of California at Berkeley because my father was teaching philosophy there. We moved out there in the uh, very early 1960s um, to Davis in the Central Valley. And I went to school at uh, Berkeley, where I was a psychology major. My initial interest was animal behavior, especially studying these fellows, which are Miriam's kangaroo rats, which are the model for Speedy Gonzales of cartoon fame. My interest there, this is my first smell experiment, actually. I had no idea I was going to become a smell scientist. But this was the, uh, the object of study. Crotalus viridis is the western rattlesnake. It preys on the kangaroo rat. And my question was, can the kangaroo rat smell the presence of rattlesnakes? So we let rattlesnakes live on a, in an aquarium on gravel. And then we released the kangaroo rats into the, in various aquariums that either had rattlesnake scent or not. And sure enough, they could tell. So they're, they're on the watch for their predators by scent. This interest in animal behavior led me east to Philadelphia, where I did a, a PhD in in psychology, again, biological psychology, working with mice and how they mate on the preference of smells. They can smell differences between closely bred strains and prefer to mate with stra mice of a different strain based on the odor. And in fact, there's a human correlate to this. We all have genes that we share with these mice that are correlated with a body smell, and people tend to mate with somebody with a slightly different body scent. Very strange. I can spin an evolutionary story about it. While I was in uh, Philadelphia after my graduate work, I did a postdoctoral fellowship and then was a, at a research institute called the Monell Center for the Chemical Senses, where we study taste and smell. And while there, I did a story for the National Geographic. They came to us, actually, and they wanted to do a, a story on smell, which they had prepared. And we helped them do a scratch and sniff smell survey that was sent out to 14 million people back in the late 80s. So it was the biggest scratch and sniff test in the history of mankind. <laughs> and that brought me some notoriety. It brought me enough notoriety that I was hired into the perfume industry as one of the fairly rare uh, number of psychologists there that study people's response to smell and wh what it is that causes them to like some perfumes and not others, whether it's in kitty litter or something a little more elegant like Estee Lauder. Ah, that was the smell survey. So my challenge today is to talk about literature. Now, I do write about it quite a bit in the book for the following reason. There's I'm sure you've heard this theory, or some, especially a psychologist you know, may have told you that, well, people have a very poor vocabulary for scent, that we're just very bad at describing smells. And they even make the claim that it's just because we don't have enough words. All right, well, who's making these claims? The, the people that are doing it are psychologists, my colleagues. 
who are typically studying college sophomores. <laughs> college sophomores are sort of the stand-in for humanity in general in a, in a university laboratory. And what they do is uh, give them tests where they sit them down in a sterile kind of laboratory cubicle, hand them a, a jar of smell, say, smell this, and what is it? Name it. And people are really crummy at doing this. Perfumers are crummy at doing this. Everybody's crummy at this because it's a very difficult and unnatural kind of task. It's not something we, we ever have to do in, daily, in real life. We don't get a smell with no context, no source, no other information, and are forced to name it. So on the basis of this rather limited test, there's this odd scientific idea that we're, we're bad at describing smells and that we lack the vocabulary. But how can that be? I mean, in everyday life, we describe smells all the time. I, you know, I could say, oh, that smells like, you know, uh, Rufus's barn on the West Road in Dorset. It smells like that combination of leather harnesses and, you know, lawnmower oil. And you know what I'm talking about, and I've just described it, and it's accurate, or you can go test and see if it's accurate. And every brand name of a scented product is an adjective for describing smell. Play-Doh, Crayola, go on and on. So, it's, a, it's an odd idea, and I think it's a wrong one. In the course of doing the book, I started reading literature. I mean, I'm, I grew up as a scientist. I didn't take a lot of literature courses, unlike my cousin Peter and all my Dartmouth-educated relatives. I stayed with the hard science curriculum. So I started going through a lot of literature, poetry, uh, art, to look for examples of creative artists who use smell in their work one way or another. And I found quite a lot of it, and what I'll do is talk about some of that tonight, and also about how the artistic use of smell in literature sometimes confirms what we really know scientifically about odor perception, and sometimes it just, conf it just um, promotes myths that really aren't correct. I wish I knew. There we go. We'll do another one. Mark Twain was a, a big odor fan. Uh, you'll see a lot of his uh, stories include smells. There's a terrific one called The Black Hole of San Francisco, which was one of his short newspaper reports that he, he did when he was very early on in San Francisco during the gold rush. And it's an account of a, of a crowded, overheated, stifling courtroom in San Francisco and all the different smells of the various types of humanity that were packed in there. He also wrote a famous story um, whose name is escaping me at the moment about a fellow who's returning home on a train, dying, because he's contracted pneumonia. He had agreed to accompany the remains of his friend back home in the coffin. They put the coffin on the train, he got on the train, and they started striking up a conversation with the conductor. Somebody unknown to him put a, a Limburger cheese in a box next to the coffin. And gradually, next to the stove and the caboose, the cheese smell started getting higher and higher, and they made the wrong assumption that it was the other box that was causing the odor. <laughs> and they go to great, they, they were burning incense and trying to fumigate the place. Uh, he ended up standing out in a driving snowstorm on the back platform of the caboose, and that's where he got his fatal pneumonia. But uh, what, it's, a, it's a wonderful story for showing the effect of context. We know now, as psychologists, that I can give you a smell, this one particular molecule, and if I tell you that it's a, a, a beautiful natural essence distilled from such and such plants, it'll be nice, you'll love it, um, your heart rate won't change, your attention will go up. If I tell you the same molecule is an industrial byproduct and possibly toxic, suddenly your throat will close up, your heart will race, you'll find it very disagreeable to smell and so forth. Our brain is constantly interpreting what the nose tells it. And uh, Twain's story is a great way to, to show that um, misinterpretation of context can lead to some s bad results. Helen Keller wrote a lot about her condition. Um, she's the source of another myth that I write about in the book. The myth is that blind people are somehow more sensitive to smells than sighted people. I have people come up to me at cocktail parties and they find out that I work in the perfume business and say, oh, do you know Helen Keller? She had a really sensitive sense of smell. How do they know this? Helen Keller passed away in 1965, I think. So she's got a great PR machine working for her still. In fact, she writes uh, in these essays of hers about how smell is very important to her, but only because it fills up the gap that's left by her not being able to see or hear. So clearly, when you're re reduced to a single sense, that's going to seem more important. 
and you'll be paying more attention to it and it's occupying more of the day. But tests of blind versus sighted people back to the 1800s show no difference in sensitivity, whatever, between the two groups. Ah, here she is with President Kennedy, so she, she had good PR. The Helen Keller myth goes on, I mean, the Daredevil comic, uh, Daredevil had some, I can't remember what his problem was, he had some catastrophe as a youth that left him blind and deaf, but with these the, uh, other super senses, and so he can, he can smell things incredibly, uh, at incredible distances and at very low concentrations, and this helps him fight crime and so forth, so you see that, and, uh, was it Matt Damon, I always get Matt Damon confused with the other fellow, who's the... Ben Affleck. This is Ben Affleck in a tight leather uh, suit, if, if that's your sort of thing. But the psychology of it is completely wrong. The smell, not the suit. This is another book you may have heard of. Uh, Patrick Siskin, a German novelist. It's called Perfume, the story of a murderer. It was a huge hit in Germany. Uh, it got translated here and, again, many people recommend it to me when they hear that I'm into smell. Um, Try not to be impolite about it, but I intensely dislike this book. Uh, it's, a hit, it's a novel that's been made into a movie, actually, also, with, um, by a kind of pan-European production that came out a couple of years ago. It's a kind of grotesque novel. It's about a guy who was born in the 1600s in Paris, and, uh, and an orphan, and he has no body scent of his own. He has no smell, but he's born with this incredible nose. He can smell anything at any distance. Um, and he becomes obsessed with getting this, uh, creating a body smell himself. He runs into a perfumer and he learns from him in a matter of a couple of years all there is to know about perfumery. Uh, it's, you can rent the movie on Netflix, I would, you know. <laughs> it's not high on my queue. It, there's a lot of wigs and, and bosoms. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Dustin Hoffman is in it, actually. Who knew that he needed money that badly? Uh, he's the perfumer, and this is the, uh, the psychopath who then decides that he has to go around and collect the essence of women's body odors, especially starting with redheads. There's this myth of the redheaded woman having a special, uh, an especially attractive body aroma. And what he does is murder them and then extract their, their personal scent by enfleurage, which is the, the ancient um, technique of putting scented materials like rose petals in fat and using the fat to extract the scented oils. So it's grotesque, which I have no problem with. I thought the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is one of the greatest horror films of all time. <laughs> I'm a fan of the genre, but this one just, uh, it put me off. The other reason it put me off is that the psychology is completely wrong. This guy, his name is Gronwy, is able to smell a new perfume created in, uh, this, by this time, 18th century Paris and go right to the laboratory and start pouring a copy of it. He could smell the perfume down to each individual component instantly. This is just the exact opposite of how our noses work and how perfumers' noses work. A perfumer, when he smells a new perfume, smells an object. He says, oh, this is an oriental type. And he smells a little closer and he goes, well, it's an oriental type, but it's got a kind of green undertone. And then he says, oh, it's an oriental type with a green undertone and this twist that makes it unique. So he starts with the forest and goes down to the individual trees. Nobody is able to smell like this. In fact, if I give you a bouquet of six uh, items, like banana, rose, and so forth, I pour them together, nobody can get more than four. Nobody can reach in and identify more than four of those smells from that bouquet. There's just a brain limit on how much information we can process that way. So this is a, it's quite a fantasy. Well, in the course of, of um, reading all of these uh, artistic representations of smell, I came to, a, to a, a mini theory on olfactory genius. In other words, what is it that makes some artists, poets, composers good at expressing themselves about smell and through smell? And it, there's three points to it. One is awareness. You have to be aware of smell, and not everybody is. Um, some estimates place the number of uninterested people at about 15%. 15% of the population either doesn't get the odors where they get them and they don't care. They're just, they can walk by an open rotting garbage can and just be oblivious to it. So the olfactory genius has to tune into smells, be aware of them, has to be, have empathy about them. In other words, be able to tell 
what another person is thinking about that smell when that person walks by, um, by an odor source and, and interacts with it. I was in Portugal once and John Kenneth Galbraith was in this little dining uh, commons of a, of a hotel I was staying at and he was this tall elderly guy to the famous ambassador and economist and as he and his companions left the room there was a vase of roses there and he stopped he was like six foot five and he bent all the way over to smell the roses and they just he paused and he walked out so I knew he was somebody who was completely into odor and into fragrance and finally you have to have an imagination that lets you create and use smell as a metaphor use it as symbolically uh, weave it into your into your artistic work. All right, this guy's probably, uh, can anybody guess who this is? Kurt Cobain. Kurt Cobain, well, there's the Pacific Northwest <laughs> relation weighs in, exactly right. The Seattle grunge rocker, Kurt Cobain. Um, he, what was his band? I'm blocking it already. It was uh, Nirvana, thank you. The grunge rock movement was, was his baby. He started it. He was obsessed with smell in his personal life. He left these diaries. He killed himself after being married to Courtney Love. That, that's not quite. <laughs> All right, let me, I'll rephrase that at a later time. Uh, but he's, these depressive diaries where he talks about smells and girlfriends and perfumes and so forth, but none of it found its way into his art. So he only had one of the three traits for olfactory genius. On the, on the musical theme, I know this isn't literature, but this guy is, his, his nickname is Odo Seven. He's a, a smell jockey in Europe in clubs. This guy will go to these uh, nightclubs and raves and festivals and so forth and set up these pans of, of warm water and fans. In the pans, he melts these mater fragrance materials, these gums and aromatic essences, and then he wafts them out over the audience to influence the mood of the crowd. Here he is blowing a fan. Now, it sounds kind of goofy, but what he can do is actually, he can change moods, but he can also, he can make a, 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 an audience at a nightclub laugh with a smell, which is sort of weird. What he does is play like Metallica, some headbanging rock, and then he blows baby powder over the crowd. <laughs> and it's just so incongruous that people just, just crack up. So it is possible to, to uh, play with the meanings of smell. Richard Wagner, again on a musical theme, um, had a couple of aspects to his fragrance involvement in his artistic creativity. He was a fragrance nut. He would use smells to get him going creatively when he was composing, when he was writing uh, the operas. He would take scented baths. He wore uh, these elaborate furs that he dusted with scented powders and so forth. Very indulgent in this. And of course, it did find its way into his work. Whenever he talks about duft, which is the German word for fragrance or aroma, there's always some erotic charge in the air, um, uh, whether it's incest or, 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 or not, uh, typically. And then there are all of his less popular characters, like Beckmesser the Jew and so forth, that are always smelling of tar and pitch and the devil. So this comes through in the lyrics and in the music. In fact, he, has a, he was famous for inventing the light motif, which is a musical phrase to represent an individual character, and one character who breaks wind a lot, and that's represented on the piccolo. It's genius of a, in its own way. To Emily Dickinson, now you'd think this would be the transition from darkness to light and from heaviness to sweetness. Um, Emily Dickinson, uh, the Belle of Amherst, was more or less a shut-in, of course, during her lifetime when she wrote all these odd little po poems. Uh, she was also a big gardener. She had a, a conservatory attached to the house in Amherst where she grew flowers. This is in the mid-1800s. Now, many other ladies of that time and of her station in life grew exotic flowers. But what they grew were fancy orchids and big showy blossoms. Emily Dickinson's flowers were only smelly. She specialized in very fragrant flowers, bourbon roses and so forth, these really uh, heavily charged uh, scents. And like Wagner, she used these to compose. These, these were considered too out there in Victorian times to actually put in the living room or in the drawing room. You wouldn't want to give people the wrong idea about yourself. So she kept these in her study and by her bed and would use them to inspire her work. Now, I hadn't read much Emily Dickinson when I started writing the book. I came across Camille Paglia's um, critique of her. Emily Dickinson had thought, been after she was rediscovered and her poems were published, she was thought to be this 
beautiful expressor of uh, emotional tonality and so forth. And Camille Paglia came along and said, no, Emily Dickinson is the weirdest, creepiest poet around. Her poems are full of death and vampirism. She's the, she's the female Marquis de Sade, is what uh, she was called by Paglia. I thought, well, that's a little over the top, but uh, intriguing. So I went and I leafed through her collected works. She's got 1,100 of these very short little poems. Uh, about 400 of them are about flowers. The rest are all about bees and death, as far as I can tell. But I'm not an expert on this. Her flower poems aren't about the smell. They're about, even though she composed the, the work while she was breathing in these fragrances, the, the poems are all about extracting the aromatic essence from the plants in a very vampire-like kind of way. Um, and the, the attar of roses is not brought out by the sun, but is, is wrung from the blossom by screws. I mean, ouch, it's really, it, Camille Paglia, I, I, I think, was right now. She was not over the top. Um, you can find her, she kept an herbarium as well. She had a, a book of pressed flowers that she started when she was a girl and kept through her life. And it's now, you know, pristinely displayed in the uh, rare book room of the Houghton Library at Harvard. And everybody says this is such a lovely collection of her kind of, you know, feminine poetry and stuff, but I'm, my reevaluation of that is that it's more the, the trophy case of a serial killer, if you really <laughs> want to think about it. So that's my reevaluation of Emily Dickinson. Feel free to disagree. I will, I will, I will take shots from English professors and uh, anybody know who this is? So Leopold von Sacher Masoch, who gave his name to masochism, and who wrote the story Venus and Furs, among other things, which is the, the, one of the earliest and greatest Victorian erotic novels, um, all about his uh, infatuation with, the, with his mistress named Wanda and her whip and so forth. And he was the, for, for the ultimate love slave of the 19th century, I guess. The story itself is fantastic about smell. It's, when it starts out, he's, he's uh, infatuated with Wanda, and everything smells great. The evenings are heavy with uh, luscious, dewy mist, and every blossom he passes has a great fragrance to it. And then they agree to go on this trip, and he, his, his warped dream is to submit to Wanda. And as she takes advantage of that and kind of forces him further and further away, the smells in the book become less nice and then positively bad. They follow the arc of the book downward. He's, you know, she, she travels first class on the train to Venice and puts him in third class with all these stinky uh, Italian peasants and Russian cavalry officers smoking cigars and eating salami and garlic and so forth. And she's in first with the beautiful smells. And he gets further and further away. And the last scene is him looking at the statue that he thinks looks like her in the, the Medici Palace. And um, it's completely scentless. So the, the scent is gone. So it's a great, it's a great story arc told in in fragrance. Hawthorne is one of the, uh, the best American writers on smell. House of the Seven Gables has great episodes where uh, the village feasts are described in such a way that you just wanna, you wanna start eating immediately. Um, he talks about the, the keeper of the custom house, I guess, it was up in Boston, and how this fellow um, would they didn't have a lot to do in the custom house. It was a political appointment back in the time of Jefferson and, and Jackson and so forth. They'd while a time away talking and remembering meals that they'd had back in the administration of George Washington. And this one portly custom house keeper could remember in minute detail everything that was eaten and everything that was served and how it was cooked and spiced. So uh, I think Hawthorne was a guy who loved to eat. He also wrote one of the best fragrant short stories in literature. It's called Rappuccini's Daughter. You know this one? It's about a, uh, it's, it's set in kind of Renaissance Italy and there's a medical student who goes to Padua to, to learn medicine and he falls in love with a, uh, a girl who's in the same building, sort of. And she's the daughter of this strange doctor, Rappuccini, who, whose specialty is breeding exotic and toxic plants. So he, he makes these weird hybrids that are very lethal, but his daughter has grown up around them all the time to the point where she's immune to their poison. But she's absorbed it, and she becomes poisonous to other people, including the boyfriend. And I won't, I won't give it away. You, have to, you, should, you should read it, but it's a, it's a fantastic story. It's tragic. It's, 
It's about love. And these are just some weird poisonous plants around Berkeley, California that I was, I don't know. People grow jimson weed in their lawns there and they're probably eating the seeds for, you know, non-Native American ceremonial purposes. <laughs> they're, they're hallucinogens, but they're kind of dangerous. Ray Bradbury, and, and there's, a, there's a lot of fragrance in science fiction. And Ray Bradbury is a great example of it. In a number of his stories, he, um, in The Illustrated Man, which is kind of a whole set of different sci-fi no, uh, stories from, I guess, the early 50s, he's got, um, he's got one where a, there's a house of the future, the happy home house that you can buy with all these, what we would now think of as kind of electronic ambient features, you know, like built-in sound and so forth. But the, the happy life home of the future also has odophonics. So it's a special room you go into, and it's kind of like the holodeck in Star Trek. You can dial up any sort of scene. You can dial up the African savanna, and then the odophonic system kicks in, and you can start smelling the water hole and the, the lions, the stinky lions, and, and uh, the scents on the breeze and so forth. And some weird things happen in that novel, in that, in that story. His bigger smell work, I think of it as a smell work, is Fahrenheit 451, the futuristic story where firefighters are now turned into censors and they go around confiscating and burning every book they can find. And, of course, there's one famous smell image of it is the mechanical hound, which is programmed to remember 10,000 different scents, different odor profiles of people. So if you're a, an underground... Uh, dissident and you own books, they'll, put, they'll have your fragrance profile on, uh, in the computer of the mechanical hound and uh, if you don't give up the books, they'll send the hound after you and the hound's got poison fangs that will kill you. And so uh, that's, apparently, there's a new movie of it coming out apparently, so they're actually going to show, unlike the old movie with uh, Julie Christie, this one will show the mechanical hound. But in Bradbury's novel, smells play a very symbolic role. You've got this kind of cramped life where uh, uh, Montag, the fireman, all he, the only smells he knows in daily life are the, sm the smell of kerosene in his flamethrower as he destroys the books, and sometimes the smell of the moldy books as they come falling out of the hiding places in people's homes. But then as he meets this young girl and she kind of opens him up to the idea of the real pleasures of life and of being away from the, the, wall, the video walls that occupy everybody's waking moment, he... He starts smelling her perfume, she's talking about smells, he starts noticing real life, and when he finally just ditches it, he, his own house gets torched, he leaves with some books and finds these hobos, people who've memorized books, professors who used to teach but they don't want it anymore, so they have their texts in their heads, and they live this kind of uh, hobo existence outside of the cities. He goes, he finds them, and suddenly everything he's experiencing is, is, is fragrant. So it's the smell of liberty, of freedom both intellectually and, and physically, that's represented by smell. Which, of course, brings us to dogs and another myth. Um, the myth is that we, the dogs have such a better nose than we do. It turns out we underrate ourselves. Um, if you do chemical tests and, and highly controlled laboratory experiments, we are almost as sensitive, molecule for molecule, in the nose as the dog is. The molecules that they pick up, say, when they're looking for drugs in airports, we can smell those too, and we can smell those at similar low concentrations. Of course, most people are not willing to get around on all fours and crawl through the luggage carousel at the airport <laughs> on a daily basis. And the dog, to be fair, devotes a lot more of his brain matter to smell than we do. Uh, but that brings up another literary um, instance. Virginia Woolf wrote an entire short novel called Flush, a biography, which was about uh, a dog, a spaniel, owned by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, the poet. And it's told from the dog's point of view, including the dog's nose point of view. Uh, is there a phrase for that? Point of view, point of nose, whatever it might be. So Flush is this dog, and from puppyhood to old age, you get this whole biography. It's not really a moment-by-moment -moment smell account of a dog's life. What it is is the dog's life as the Barrett Brownings move from London to Italy and France and back to England. And every once in a while there are these beautiful set pieces where he's taken for a walk at Regent's Park and you get the whole smellscape of Regent's Park or where he goes off the leash in some little village in Italy and you get the whole 
smellscape of that Italian village. So they're great set pieces. You'd have to say she was aware of smell into it and able to use it very imaginatively. Okay, well the last thing I want to hit is this idea of odor memory. Uh, smells have a very special way of evoking the past for us. Uh, you, sometimes very unexpectedly you come across a smell and it lights up a, a scene from the past in, in vivid detail and often with a, an emotional tinge to it. Often this is attributed to Marcel Proust, the French novelist. Uh, he's called the first one to have noticed this, the first one to have described it, the best one to have described it. To which I say, nya, 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 nya. It's just <laughs> wrong. He, if you, Proust, of course, it's the remembrance of, of lost time. Uh, this, it's a multi-novel series. It's 3,300 pages of novel, if you really want to go for it. But early in the first one, in Swan's Way, the narrator, who's a young version of Marcel himself, eats this madeleine. I think I've got a madeleine picture. Okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a hostess Twinkie without any filling, basically. If you're not into French cuisine, that's your ecological equivalent. He dips this into a lemon tea, eats it, and, so, and well, this is what? In the conventional telling, he dips it in tea, and as he eats it, he's suddenly back in his childhood in Cambrai, this little village in France. Go read the chapter. It takes five pages. Because first he dips it, it's like, oh, wait a minute, there's something going on. He gets an emotion, he can't tell what it is. He searches for where it was. Did I know, what, 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 what? He's, he's groping, he tastes it again, he tries blocking his ears and closing his eyes and trying to force the memory to come back. This is not what we think of as smell memory. We think of smell memory as bingo. It lights on and there you're back in third grade and Mrs. Merrick is handing you that book with the weird smell in the binding of the glue, you know, I mean, it's just, that's, it's, very, it's a very quick thing. Proust's example is tortured and forced and, and not very effective. And in fact, he doesn't talk that much else about smell in the remaining 2,999 pages. Um, and I'm a bit of an American arts and letters chauvinist, so you can go back uh, and show that people were talking about the specialness of odor and smell memory way before he did. Poe. Uh, has some great lines in an essay about how smell is unique in that way. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a doctor as well as a poet, wrote this collection of stories called The Autocrat of the Breakfast Table. It was a bunch of guys at a boarding house kind of talking, and so it's in the form of these dialogues and little lectures. And at one point, the doctor at the table gives this little uh, account for why smell and not the other senses should be so good at bringing memories back. And he talks about it in terms of the wiring of the olfactory system and how it goes to, directly to the brain and so forth. A kid recently came, a kid, a young uh, college graduate from Columbia came out with a book called Proust was a Neuroscientist, where again, he repeats this canard that Proust was the first to describe odor memory and that in fact he anticipated many uh, de developments in modern neuroscience by expanding on the connections between smell and memory. <laughs> Sorry. Holmes knew the anatomy. He got the anatomy when he was a medical student at Harvard. He talked about it 60 years before Proust did. So we can be, we can be proud of our uh, literary heritage here and, and we don't have to give away the first to them. This is Henry Adams who wrote, among other things, he wrote histories, but he also wrote The Education of Henry Adams, his third person biography, or auto, it's a third person autobiography if that makes sense. <laughs> And I like, in my book, I talk about him as a, as a counterexample to Proust. Proust, when he talks about memory in his work, it's always him in the act of recovering the memory. It's about how I reached back and thought about this and retrieved this memory and what it meant. And it's, it's, it's his process about the memory. And it's very private. And if you haven't been to Cambrai or if you haven't eaten a Madeleine, you don't get it. Henry Adams has some great examples, especially uh, when he talks about his boyhood around the time of the Civil War about going outside. It's this, this, this great paragraph about all the smells of a summer afternoon. It, I, I think that in Massachusetts in like 1861. And it's an accessible memory. Anybody can get it. We've all smelled things like this. It's kind of a public, open, inviting sort of literary style of smell as opposed to Proust. So I'd, another recommendation. <laughs> you can always go for the Madelines, but enough of Marcel. <laughs> uh, John Steinbeck was another person who was notably involved with smells. Um, Cannery Row, 
course, opens with a, a smell line. Cannery Row in California is a, a dream, a noise, a stink, a something, a something. He, he, he's always about the smell of it. Of course, it was a reeking town. They brought, there was a huge sardine fleet there that would bring sardines back, and then he'd be steamed and, and canned. There's the Del Mar Canning Company. It was a, it took, the, the stocks eventually crashed in the 1950s, but it was a huge business and a very stinky one and controversial at the time because the railroads wanted to bring in tourists and put up fancy motels in the Monterey Coast, but the money was coming from the sardine factories. And he has a great, there's a great paragraph, which again I cite in the book. This is Doc of Doc's Marine Biological Laboratory that he talks about in the book. This guy right down on the beach had a, uh, uh, a laboratory where he'd collect marine specimens and send them to schools and colleges. And there's this one long paragraph where Steinbeck talks about the smell of Doc's laboratory. Everything from the oil that was used to, to lubricate the microscope, to the packing material, the ropes, the rats, the stinky starfish. It's this great tracking shot through smell of Doc's laboratory. So it can be, you can have scene setting as well. It can be a very naturalistic thing. Richard Kipling, uh, often quoted for the, uh, the line about nothing like smells to make the heartstrings crack, calling to you, old man, come back. People quote the first two lines of this, this poem called Lichtenberg, but in fact, it's all about a, uh, an Australian cavalry trooper in the Boer War in South Africa, and he rides by this uh, tree called Waddle. It has these amazing golden blossoms. In fact, it's the floral emblem of, Austri of Australia. And this trooper rides by, he sees it, he just puts his face in this, this brand, he's on horseback, and he puts his face in this bunch of blossoms and is immediately transported back to his home in the Hunter River Valley in Australia. And so most people don't follow through the poem and don't even know what Waddle is, but he gets it. He says, Kipling, who is a great war poet and story writer, he says, uh, it's, in, it's in poetry, but basically the line is that the, this recollection happens as fast as a rifle shot through the brain. Sort of the opposite of Proust's chewing on his madeleine for 15 minutes or so. I don't want to belabor this. There are some people who don't get it, who are very artistic. Gertrude Stein is not one of my favorite people in general. And um, she's got a great, great, a kind of negatively great phrase about smell. She says, there is no use, there is no use at all in smell, in taste, in teeth, in toast, in anything. There is no use at all and the respect is mutual. <laughs> this is why she let Alice B. Toklas do all the cooking. I mean, being a scientist, you have to have kind of negative examples to prove the theory. Toni Morrison, uh, I don't want to end on a negative note, but if you want to read Beloved and look at the smell examples there, tell me if they make any sense to you whatsoever. And there are a couple of great new novels, uh, I should point out, since I've been kind of doing this historical survey. Martha Cooley, just a couple of years ago, wrote a book called 33 Swoons. It's all about identity and rem remembering her father and his kind of secret life and so forth. And he, was a, he designed perfumes and perfume bottles. And uh, it's an amazingly complex novel, but she gets fragrance and she understands the smelling of it and what it can do for people and how it can make you a different person. It kind of serves as a mask. And Rajika Jha uh, wrote something called Smell, a novel. She's Indian, and it's about a story of an Indian woman growing up in Africa, I guess in, um, where was Idi Amin before he kicked everybody out? Uganda. She gets, her family gets kicked out, and she's sent to live with relatives in Paris. So she's completely out of place culturally, but she's totally into smell. And this becomes her kind of uh, culinary erotic journey between cultures and through uh, and through France, so it's a fantastic novel. So people are doing good work at this, and um, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. No, it must have been a typo for Dickinson. I know nothing about Dickens. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Anybody else? There are a lot of remarkable uh, effects of the sensation of smell on other biological functions. 
I'm sure you're aware of the, uh, its relationship to the immune function, immune system, and as well as uh, some sort of relationship with the transplantation antigens, the HLA uh, antigens, and this is the reason why mice are pregnant mouse was placed in a cage with a with her non-mate of a different strain will abort and things this, like that. This, this is a voice from my past. He's talking about <laughs> mouse sex and, uh, and, and reproduction and smell. This is, these, these are the phenomena that got me interested in the field, um, and especially this immune strain. That, that one little black mouse I showed you early on was one that I worked with. There were two strains bred for cancer research genetically identical except for these immune genes. And the immune genes are the ones that control your rejection response. So it's, what, it's the genes that they check if you're getting a, a kidney transplant, say. And it turns out that smells associated with just those genes are enough to communicate um, difference to these, to these mice and they'll prefer to mate with the other one. So my question was, you know, the people at the Monell Center wanted to know what's the chemical, what, what, is, the, what is the odor, the source? molecularly. My question was simpler. It's like, if, if these mice can smell each other apart, can we smell them apart? So I, so I did an experiment with Lewis Thomas and, and some people at the Monell Center where we took mouse, <clears throat> mouse leftovers. We took mouse turds, let's be frank about it. We took little mouse pellets in, a, in a, uh, centrifuge tubes and had people smell and ask, same or different? We could use whole mice in little Tupperware containers with holes cut and uh, mouse urine. And all three of them, people, you know, a panel of eight or ten people could tell the difference in smell between these, the mice and their body products. So there's, it's, it's a very general mammalian thing. And uh, as I mentioned, I think people, people are probably responding to this too at a very low level when they're finding mates and spouses. How do I account for the celebrity perfume craze? Well, it's, it's killing the industry. It's killing my industry. The industry has become Hollywood in its um, business model. They churn out way too much product. There are too many movies. There's too many perfumes. And they rely on the occasional blockbuster to fund all of the losers. And um, although, you know, Britney Spears fragrances have done very well uh, commercially, and so have um, Paris Hilton's. But for each of those, you can mention 20 B-list, C-list, and D-list celebrities who are, their licensing deals that just shouldn't have been done, and they're bringing down the tone of the entire sector, as far as I can tell. And who can keep up? There's an average of three new perfumes launched every day. Yeah, it's insane. Three? Yeah. Yeah. Who has the better smell, or men or women? Who's better smell, men or women? Well, let me guess who you think. <laughs> All right. She, Smeller, who has the better nose? The conventional wisdom is that women have a better nose than men. And in this case, the conventional wisdom is correct. On average, on average, women can detect smells at a lower concentration and can name smells more accurately. But remember, that's a team average. So, you know, one player on the other team could be better than a given player on the other team. So. I want to tell you, though, that sometimes the difference is extreme. I mean, Okay, there's, uh, thank you for sharing, but I'm going you know, to steer right away from it. <laughs> Have you, I'm sure you've read the novel Jitterbug Perfume? Oh, yeah, uh, Tim, Tom, Tim Robbins, Tom, Tom, Tom Robbins. If anyone hasn't read that, it's a great novel. I've been meaning to go back to that. Tom Robbins is kind of one of those, you know, it's a goofy, funny thing, but I've been meaning to go back and look at it to see kind of, how he really connects with smell and whether it would make sense to me today. I think I read it back when I was in college. There was one other, one last question. Yeah, I, had a, I wondered about um, like the earliest, you know, perfume uh, creators. Like were they, did they come out of France? Was it, because that's sort of in my mind, I think of perfume and the history of, you know, all those great houses and the historic perfumes. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that where, or like all around the world, were there people that were creating scents? India so the question is, where, what, what's the origin of modern perfumery? Uh, it's actually Italy in the Renaissance. Um, it, it, was, it was actually a problem-solving thing. At the time, uh, Italy was the leader in making 
uh, glove leather, soft leathers for ladies' gloves and aristocrats' gloves. And the method of tanning the hides was to dip them in vats of urine, the cow urine, for the ammonia. It was part of the process. So the leather stank. Leather did not smell good, even though it was supple and beautiful and could be dyed lovely colors. So partly to overcome the bad smell of leather, they started using fragrant materials and resins to perfume the gloves. So that's why in uh, Florence and, um, and in Rome, you had the kind of origins of modern perfumery. And then it moved to France because a lot of the growing and the materials were there in the Côte d'Azur in the south of France. You get the lavender and the jasmine and so forth. Today, not to shatter your dreams, but today it's New Jersey. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the chemical industry, you know, you need a huge, huge vats and storage facilities and manufacturing and so chilling. it's not organic as much today as it, I mean, originally those were the, the true essences. Originally it was barks and essences and a few animal products which aren't used today, the musks and so forth. Um, today, it's, as a matter of cost, it's impractical to do a mass product using all pure naturals. They're just extremely expensive. You could do it. Um, but it would, nobody could afford it, so. Anyway, thank you all again. Thank you.